Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Eden. I'm an alcoholic, and I've been sober since February 15th of 1994, for which I'm tremendously grateful. My home group is the Glacier Group in Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, I love my home group, and I'm really super glad to be here tonight. Um, so, and speaking was a surprise, but it, but that's perfect, right? I don't have to think about myself too much that way. Um, so, what I understand my responsibility at a speaker meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is to share with you what I was like, what happened for me, and what I'm like today. And that is, uh, I'll do that to the very best of my ability. Um, So what I was like, I'm a fifth generation alcoholic. My father tells me my father's been sober in the, uh, got sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous 35 years ago. Um, I, uh, what I know about me is that I I was born terrified. And, uh, you know, I just hit the planet uncomfortable. I am not comfortable in my own skin. And the evidence that we have for that is that they put me on phenobarb in my first year of life for night terrors. And, uh, and then I was allergic to phenobarbital, so they took it back away. And that's kind of the story of my life, right? Like, I'm afraid, I'm crazy, I need something to take the edge off, and then I'm allergic to the solution. So, um, so but from the time I was, however many months I was when they took away the phenobarb until I found a drink, it was really, really tough. I, I, uh, um, my first strategy was to read books and be good. I thought, well, if I just follow the rules and I'm perfect enough, then I'll get to be okay somehow. And um, it, so that's what I tried to do. And so I was the kid in uh, at recess who was over there on the other side, you know, like sitting alone at the picnic table with bifocal glasses at the age of seven. They called me dictionary, you know, like I'm completely isolated and disengaged from any other kid in the classroom. I um uh, and, and I was just miserable and uptight. If you've ever read the book Secret Garden, you know, I was like wound up uptight, just, 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 I just couldn't take a breath. I couldn't get a breath. And when I was 12 years old, I had an opportunity to go to Mexico on a school trip for a month. And on that trip to Mexico, I took a drink. I don't know what it was. It was something that you could get on the beach in Mexico when you were 12. And, uh, which was just about anything, right? Um, uh, back at that time, at least, I don't know today, but, um, what I know is that I drank to blackout and puking and, um, and I scared everybody around me. I came to the next morning and, uh, you know, I was drinking with the 16 year old guys and I was like, I was this tiny, tiny, tiny little 12 year old girl. And, um, and I came to, and they were afraid. They're like, are you all right? And all I could think of is, when do we go again? I'm ready. You know, I, I took a drink and I took a breath and I knew that I had somehow found a way that I was going to get to be all right. And, and up until that point, I, you know, like there was nothing all right about my life. A, a lot of drama and a lot of, a, a lot of transition and a lot of change. You know, we, I was, my mom was looking for the answer in San Francisco in the 70s. So I went to 15 schools and lived in 18 homes and everything was changing around me all the time and nothing was ever really comfortable. And I was uncomfortable to begin with before even any of that started. So I took a drink and I found a way that I got to be all right. And I, and I was unapologetic from that point forward about what I was about. Like I knew and I was clear and I wasn't confused and I didn't really care what your opinion was. It was tough because it was San Francisco, you know, I was 12 and, um, so, so booze is, it was hard for me, but I went to school around the corner from Haight Ashbury. So, um, so I smoked a lot of pot, which I don't actually like, and, uh, did a lot of hallucinogens, which I like very much. Um, but I, you know, I will, I'll do anything. I will use anything, do anything, and try anything in order to take the edge off. Fundamentally, I'm not comfortable, and I'm looking to be comfortable. But but for me, you know, alcohol is absolutely, you know, I just want to drink. And so really, truly, I, I was like, that became my driving force. It was my It was my criteria for making decisions. When I was 16 years old, I was offered an opportunity to become a ballerina by somebody. She said, give me three years of your life, and I will put you in any ballet company in the world. And I thought... You know, I'm working the kissing booth at the Renaissance Fair this weekend with my boyfriend, the animal. And I'm, you know, that sounds like work. And um, 
So, so I, you know, no, thank you. And when I was 18, my family said, you know, you have college paid for. And it was my parents' divorce agreement was that I could go to any college that, that I could get into. And I kind of hung on to mostly that, that perfection thing. So I probably could have got into a school, but, but like I was clear, I knew. I, and I've said, you know, that's a really expensive place to party the way that I intend to party. I just don't feel right about it. So I moved to Homer, Alaska, where the drinking age was 19. The bars were open till 5 in the morning, and there were eight men to every woman. Much more my style, right? Like, like I just was okay with it. I was raised in communal living situations, and people, um, you know, kind of hooked up and had sex with whoever they wanted to. It was like playing tennis, and so I thought that's the game we were playing. So, um, so I played a lot lot of tennis. Um, and, and I didn't apologize about that either. You know, it, it was like, I'm going to do what I need to do to be okay about me. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. Move out of the way. I just don't really care. You know, the big book asked the question, were we, you know, ever more demanding or, or gracious? Gracious, not in my repertoire, right? I'm the demanding steamroller who's just going to tell you what I need you to do. And if you don't like it, you should move. Um, it's not very pretty. And it's, you know, it, um, but, but I just, like, it didn't connect. It didn't matter. I, uh, you know, I took a hostage in Homer, Alaska. I married a guy and ripped his heart out. I had a, I had a child, and, uh, you know, the best I could do was switch from whiskey and Cokes to brandy and 7-Up because it somehow feel, felt gentler while I was carrying that baby. Um, you know, I don't know how she got to be a healthy healthy child. didn't have anything to do with me. Uh, it, and, and again, you know, like it, it just didn't matter. I'm just doing what I need to do when I need to do it to get to somehow be okay. And... Um, you know, until, until, until what, what changed? Well, you know, I had that little girl and, uh, and looking at her, um, like I wanted to figure out how to do something different. I started to want to figure out how to do something different. And, um, you know, thank you. Thank you for your talk. There's a lot of, a lot of similarities in there and a lot of points along the way. Um, but what happened for me was I started to want to do something different and I couldn't figure it out. So the first time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I had, I had, you know, the first husband was gone. I, I mean, really, like, this is how selfish I am, right? I, I met a nice, hardworking guy. I introduced him to drugs. He wanted to make extra money for Christmas, so he was delivering drugs, probably at my direction. He got busted and went to jail. They couldn't, they had me on tape counting money, but they could never catch me. So he went to jail, and I went to go get a passport so I could go travel Southeast Asia because he was going to be busy, and I'd always wanted to do that. Instead, I got pregnant before he went to jail, and so I got a boyfriend. And by the time he got out, you know, like I had a new guy. And, I mean, just just the last time I saw that man, that child was, was two weeks old, and, uh, you know, he looked me in the eye and said, you know, you're my wife, and that's my baby, and, and this, this hurts too much. I don't, I can't see you again. Leave me alone. Go away. Like, that's what I do. I don't care how my behavior affects you. I don't have any interest in what it is that you need or are looking for in your life. If it works for me, I'm going to run with it. And, uh, so, so the husband was gone and I, I met a new guy. Oh, my boyfriend's best friend, you know, one of those stories. Um, and, uh, and, and we were kind of trying to build a life and I was back in school and I was trying to get those A's again and I couldn't quite pull it off and I couldn't quite figure it out. And I had this little girl and I had this new guy and he was, you know, a, a pretty great guy. And, and you know, I wanted to do this life thing and I couldn't, I just couldn't figure it out. And I couldn't, my problem was I was 24 years old and I could not remember the last time I'd gone 24 hours without a drink or a drug. I mean, I don't really get from the time that I was 12, I, I don't know if or when I went 24 hours without a drink or a drug. From the get-go, I did something every day. And at 24, I didn't know how not to. And, and I, but I was so arrogant, like I was pretty sure that I knew what I needed. So I was calling around to treatment center saying, you know, do you, I'm, I, like I'm in school and I'm, I have a family and I have a job. And so I'm looking for something Tuesday and Thursday nights from 6 to 8. What do you got, right? <laughs> And then that's what they said. They they laughed, and they would ask me a couple questions about my drinking, and they would ask me, you know, what that looks like, and they would suggest, you know, 
uh, residential treatment, which wasn't of interest to me at all. And uh, I remember one woman said, she said, well, whatever you do, don't try to stop drinking on your own because, you know, it could it could be dangerous. It would be dangerous. And I said, fine, I'll just keep drinking and I hung up on her. You know, I like, if you're not going to do it my way, we're not going to play. So um, finally, someone suggested that I call my family doctor. And, you know, over the years, and in retrospect in my story, I have just become so completely grateful for the work that members of Alcoholics Anonymous do in our cooperations with the professional community. Because that doctor, I think, understood what a doctor could do for an alcoholic of my type. He um, he said to me, he said, uh, he put me on, gave me like Valium, something for like three to five days, something that I could detox on safely. He put me on Anabuse. He told me to call Alcoholics Anonymous. And he told me that we would never have this conversation again. He said, this is all that I can offer you. I have no other solution than this. This is to help you detox safely, to give you a disincentive medically, and to point you towards the solution of Alcoholics Anonymous. And please don't come back on this topic. And um, so I have drunk on antabuse. It's not good. It's not comfortable. I don't recommend it. Um, but I did. I did detox, sort of. You know, it's vague. Like there was some some pot in there, and there was the drinking on the antabuse in there. So obviously, I didn't do it right away. But I also called a friend of mine who I used to drink with, who I knew was sober, and she introduced me to a woman who became my sponsor. And that woman ran me through the first nine steps, like in the first 60 or 90 days. And my experience of the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is they work fundamentally and profoundly in my life to give me relief from my head and relieve me of the obsession to drink every single time. And the work that that woman did with me out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I got relief from the obsession to drink. I healed up just a little bit. But I am I, at that time in my, you know, where I was at in that in my adventure, I did not understand like both halves of the first step. Really, truly what was happening was I was trying to figure out how to manage my life. And I had come into the rooms and I got, you know, I got feeling up a little better. And, and then what happened for me was I went to a noon meeting three days in a row. And my sponsor went on day two and day three. And she said, it's so nice to see you two days in a row. And I said, what do you mean two days in a row? I've been here three days in a row. And who the hell are you to type that tone of voice with me anyway? Really? You know, I mean, how arrogant, right? What do you, what, and oh, by the way, you know, in all that time growing up in my, in my childhood, I've been Catholic, Quaker, Christian, Zen, Mormon, Buddhist, shamans, est three times. And you cannot tell me that there's only one way to do things. So thank you very much for your input. I'm out. Of course, I was completely dishonest and 60 days sober, and so I looked at her and said, ah, nice to see you too. Um, <laughs> and then I went home, and I didn't come back. And, um, you know, and I didn't come back for, for uh, I just didn't come back. And a year later, somebody from that group called to see if I wanted to take a cake, and I, you know, laughed at them dismissively because they were stupid. Um, because I was busy, you know, I was just, I was being busy. I was being, <laughs> I was so busy. I was going to school. I lost 25 pounds, quit smoking, had a baby, you know, moved houses. Like I was busy that year. Um, and then one day after that next child was born, it, we were having company for dinner. And I think I had started with non-alcoholic wine a little while before that. It was, you know, cunning, baffling, and powerful, and just creeping back in. And, and we were having company for dinner, and I thought, oh, you know, that, you know, here's the problem. was before I didn't know how not to drink. Now I have two years without drinking, so I'll have wine with dinner. And, and if that doesn't work out, then, then I know how not to drink. It'll be fine. So we had wine with dinner, and it was fine. It was so fine, we did it the next week. And within a month, we were, I was drinking the way that I drink. And I drank for two and a half more years. And I am a maintenance alcoholic. I, I drink all day, every day. I shake awake at 3 o'clock in the morning because I can't get through the night without a shot. And I'm bloated and I'm clammy and I got that sick going on all the time. I drink boxed wine and cheap whiskey. And I'm absolutely, there's nothing ladylike about the way that I drink. There's nothing gracious about the way that I drink. You know, I am about, I'm a production drunk, right? Like, well, this is about getting the job done. And I will take, you know, I, I, I just get after, you know, really, I'm thirsty. <laughs> So I, so I drank for two and a half more years, and, and the second non-alcoholic intervention in my life. My last day drunk, my boss came in at 11 o'clock in the morning, and she and I was drunk in the office on the phone. I, I could do that because it was like a half-time job, and I, I had an office to myself. 
Um, but she was the board president and she came in and she said, hang up the phone. And she took me to coffee and she had been dating an alcoholic <clears throat> chronic relapser. And she had read to employers in the big book and she understood the disease of alcoholism. And very much like that doctor, she sat me down and she said, 90 meetings in 90 days or you're fired. And, you know, I was drinking all through that coffee date. I had booze in the car and I had booze in, you know, my purse. And I was, you know, getting drunker as we were talking. But but she was very clear. She also said to me, she said, you know, I understand that this is painful, difficult, and frightening for you. Please understand, it's not for me. And I believed her. She gave me, you know, in, again, in retrospect, what I understand is that she gave me an opportunity at that time in my drinking, I would have told you, you know, that Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work for me, that I had been here before and it wasn't a solution. I was lying to her and telling her I was going to meetings. You know, I was doing all of that managing, juggling, lying, disingenuous, you know, that, all of that insanity of alcoholism. And But what I understood, what she told me was, if you go to these 90 meetings and get signatures, you can keep this job. She said, go home for three days, dry out, and think about it. And she said, you know, I hope that you stay. I'd like for you to stay. I'd like for you to do this. But if you don't go to those 90 meetings in those 90 days, you won't have this job. And I got it, right? It was the first time I was given an opportunity to do something I didn't understand, I didn't agree with, and I didn't want to do that actually saved my life. So I didn't stop drinking at that coffee, right? I was still drinking. And I got home, and my neighbor and I, we went to a meeting together. So it's Valentine's Day, right? So picture this. Valentine's Day, I'm drunk in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I lost my nylons in that meeting. I don't know how. I, I shared for a while, right? Endlessly. And, uh, yeah, it just occurred to me a couple years ago, like, that was Valentine's. They might have thought they wanted to talk about relationships or you know, love or something. And here I was, you know, just out there. And, uh, and they asked me to stop sharing, and um, <laughs> which was completely offensive, because don't you know who I am and how much I hurt and how much I, you know. <laughs> so I was angry, and I left. I left my coat behind. I lost my nylon. So I'm wandering around uh, Anchorage, Alaska on a February night, missing half my clothes, drunk and violent in public. And, uh, you know, I went into a restaurant, a little sizzler, and I, I, to this day I can see that little hostess face, just a pretty little 16-year-old hostess looking at this mess. And, you know, and I, I, I made her seat me, and then I stormed out of there because they weren't serving me fast enough. Like, I, I just, I don't know if I, you know, ugh. Uh, so I went from there into some other shop, a gun shop, and uh, <laughs> they they laughed at me, and I said, call me a cab. So I wrote a company check to Mike, who was the cab driver, and uh, I made my way home. And, you know, my husband uh, had stopped drinking about three months before this, and he was just at his wit's end. He didn't even know, right? He had sent the kids away because I wasn't safe, and my home wasn't safe, and and I was and I was furious, right? I'm furious at the meeting because you asked me to stop sharing. And I'm furious at my husband because he he took care of our children over what it is that I think that I need. And I'm just so absolutely defiant that I just got to have what I got to have. And you are so screwing me up. And I was in a rage with him. And I fought with him. And I put my fist through all the pictures on the wall. And I my last visual of that night was slamming a butcher knife through the stainless steel of the kitchen sink. And what I get is that, you know, I went to corrections for a lot of years. What I get is that, you know, it's seconds and inches Norm Alpe talks about. I slammed the knife through the sink, thank God. I wasn't fighting with the sink. I don't know why it's not my story that, that I didn't cause harm greater than I did in my family. But what happened for me was when I came to on my first day of sobriety, I knew. Like, I knew in my gut that alcohol could no longer be my solution. And Rick talked about that line in the big book, coming to a place where I could no longer imagine a life with alcohol or without it. And I know that place. It says that we'll experience a loneliness such as few people ever know. And that moment, I was sitting in the, in the tub that morning thinking about killing myself. And my husband came home and I said, I'm thinking about killing myself. And he said, I know, honey, it's why I'm here. 
And I couldn't make it to a meeting that day until about 7.30 that night. And I went into that meeting and I was, and I, you know, and I just shook. I sat and I shook and I, thank God you could smoke then in a meeting. I chain smoked and just a woman with long-term sobriety shared her ashtray and let me use her lighter and told me it was going to be okay. And the next day I went to a noon meeting and I was walking into that meeting and there was a guy there, Jerry, and Jerry had those sparkling bright blue eyes he was sitting in a chair kind of along the wall and he looked up and he said welcome and I felt it I felt that I was welcome and I didn't feel welcome anywhere what I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt was if you could see who I was you would have no choice but to throw me away I knew that that the, it was so dark and so ugly and so pitiful in here that there wasn't anything worth saving and that person looked at me and looked me in the eye and said I was welcome, and I believed him for a second. And I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous would work for me, and I did not come in here with hope. I, I, I really, really didn't. I, I came in here because I thought I could keep that little job. And, um, and I kept coming back. And I, uh, <laughs> And within three days, I had an opinion about how you all were doing it wrong. You know, <laughs> I knew you were doing it wrong, and uh, and I and I was completely defiant against the concept of God. I absolutely, you know, looking at the steps on the wall, I and mean, I mentioned the, all of the different worldviews and religions and philosophies I'd been exposed to, and you know, the irony is that I had come to the conclusion that God was a crutch for people who couldn't figure out how to do their lives, and I didn't want any part of that. As if I had any, I could do my life, right? I, I mean, it was like it didn't even make sense. And, um, but I had an opinion and, and it didn't matter because, you know, I love, I love, love, love Bill's writing over and over again. He says, driven by the lash of alcoholism. And for me, that's like a physical visual, right? Like, like I don't want to, and I, and, and I'm going to die and I'm backed into the corner by alcoholism. And it's, it's like that, 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 that ripping apart, um, because I, I can't not drink and I can't drink and and I don't know what I'm going to do and the only thing that was being offered to me was this next step this next phone call this next meeting and little by little tiny bit by by tiny bit I got to move forward and you all were gracious with me and you were gentle with me and you were kind I got a sponsor because she was shared in a meeting that she was pregnant going to college and she didn't know how to do that but she knew how to stay sober well I had gone to college pregnant so I thought we could trade information and <laughs> You know, Ego got me a sponsor. So she didn't, you know, she, I, it was a long time before I knew, she, I understood that I didn't have anything she wanted. Um, but she asked me to pray on my knees. I called her one day, uh, and, uh, for whatever, driven by the lash of alcoholism, someday when I was completely crazy, crawling out of my skin, and she she talked me through the first couple of steps, and she asked me to pray on my knees a third step, and and you know my arrogance, my ego was so strong, I, I like I tried, I really tried. I went home, I closed the door, lock it, you know whatever, so nobody could see, and and um and I physically I couldn't get to my knees from here, like like I my I couldn't bend, I couldn't kneel. And I called her. I said, I can't. I physically, I can't get there from here. That's too far. She said, well, do you say the Lord's Prayer at the end of the meeting because you, when, we, when we have a meeting? And I wouldn't want you to think that I'm not doing what you do. So, of course, I'm doing that. And uh, so she asked me if I would just bend my knees a tiny bit during that prayer. And I said, I, I think I can do that. I still do that today. That's where I start. That was the that was the the the. the closest I could come to moving myself physically towards a relationship with a higher power. You know, I, the second step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I would argue my insanity all day long. I didn't think I was crazy, so the, there's nothing to talk about here. She finally said, you know, there, if, I don't know you know, if there is or there isn't a God, but I'm willing to concede I'm not it. Well, okay, maybe. All right, fine. I'll concede that for the moment. Right. I, I mean, the third step, three frogs sitting on a log. One decides to jump off. How many frogs are sitting on the log? Three. They made a decision. They didn't do it. Okay, fine. Whatever. I'll move on. I mean, that really, that's how I took the steps. And, and the great gift for me in Alcoholics Anonymous is the promise of the 12th step that says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I didn't have to understand God, know God, or agree with the idea of God to do the steps. 
I got to take action I didn't believe in, didn't understand, didn't agree with, and as a result of that, slowly I began to have a spiritual experience. I um, had five months of sobriety, I did a fifth step, and I shared in a meeting that I had a feeling of tentative hopefulness, that maybe, just maybe, this deal could work for me. And I work with a lot of women today, and I see new women come in, and they somehow have the idea that because they put down the booze, things should be getting better, and it's just not my experience. My experience is I put down the booze, and it was hell. Those first five months were hard, and at five months of sobriety, I had a tentative hopefulness, maybe, a little bit of hope. I um, I was crazy in Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time. Um, so I'm a project kind of a girl, right? I like to do stuff, get it done, mark it off the list, move on. So that's what I did with the steps. I, I did the first nine steps. Um, you know, that first year I did have a spiritual experience. I, I kind of was on the beam. Something happened when I hit a year of sobriety. I, I think, what, you know, what I came to discover was that somewhere deep in my heart, I had believed that if God and Alcoholics Anonymous could take care of the booze, that I could take care of the rest. Like somehow I thought my life was my job. And I got busy about trying to figure out my life. Let's put this job in order. Let's straighten up those kids. Let's get this financial thing set up. Let's, you know, I'm going to get busy about taking care of my life. And so what that looked like, you know, my sponsor had told me to call her when I needed to. So I would call, um, have a friend who says, uh, uh, points out in the big book, it says, you know, we pause when agitated or doubtful. She said, oh, no, I wait till I'm, uh, you know, homicidal or suicidal before I'm going to pause. <laughs> like that, that's kind of my style. So, so when I need to call my sponsor is when I'm backed into a corner and I'm going to drink. And, and so, you know, I worked nine steps. I got some freedom. I got busy about my life and, and I would be doing okay for a minute because I got some relief from those steps. And then something would start not going my way and the tension would start to build up and things would get serious and things would get hard. And I'd end up walking into a late night meeting saying, don't touch me. Don't talk to me. I'll kill you. And if this is sobriety, I don't want any part of it because this is insane. And, and then invariably somebody would say to me, well, you know, yeah, you should take medication, which would it just, it just made me so angry, you know, because I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. If I really want medication, I'll go to the doctor. It would make me mad enough that I would call my sponsor, and then we'd work the steps again, and I'd get some relief, and we'd start it over, and so it was like this roller coaster, right, and I did that for eight years. I so desperately wanted to be in charge of something. I was pretty sure I was supposed to be in charge of something. But about eight years of sobriety, I was on the phone with my sponsor, and, and I really, she was starting to actually back out of the room. She was doing more church and less AA, and I wasn't hearing a consistent message when I called her anymore. Like, for all those years, even though I didn't call her regular, every time I called her, she took me to the book. Every time I called her, the language was consistent. Every time I called her, I got the same solution, and it worked for me. You know, my disease, my alcoholism looks like a lot of things when it's untreated. It can look like a lot of things. When they came, when they started talking about oppositional defiance disorder, like, I don't know the first thing about it, but I'm sure that sounds like I got it, right? You know, I mean, I'll, I'll do the wrong thing for me just to oppose you because you think it's your idea for me to do something right, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so um, I, I remember sharing with her that, that, I, that I got that if, if something, you know, like this wasn't even interesting anymore. Like this roller coaster wasn't even interesting anymore. And I knew that if something didn't change, I wasn't going to be able to stay. And shortly after that, I had an experience with my son. My son's my, a truth teller in my life, my alcoholic son. At that time, he was 11, and uh, his teacher had called and said, hey, we're doing this thing where we're going to go collect fish fry at the river, and I'm wondering if your boy has hip boots. And on the front page of the paper, there's a picture of another class, and there's 100 kids on the bridge watching, and there's five kids in the river getting the fish. And I decide that that's the right action for him to take to have a, a, the most full experience of his education, right, and help his teacher out. So, so I'm going to control that. I'm going to manage it and direct it. I'm, I'm guilt, shame, coercion. I'm trying every, every tool in my toolbox to, to force and impose my will on this kid. And finally, I got him walking out the door with his hip boots in his hand. And to make myself feel better, I say, you know, really, you don't have to do that if you don't want to. And he, and he looked at me and he told me the truth. He said, no, Mom, you're making me. And I saw it. I saw what I was doing. What it is for me to be God in my life, imposing my will on other human beings, ripping away their opportunity to have choice and discover what's their path. And I am so small-minded and fear-driven that what I create just drives us all into the ground, suffocating and stifling the people that I loved. And I saw it. And I asked him to put down the boots. 
And then because I'm totally insane, I took the booths to the classroom so the teacher could give them to some <laughs> kid who more wanted to participate, right? <clears throat> that day something changed. Something broke. And I became willing to do this program completely. I changed sponsors. I got a new sponsor. She was very structured. She didn't tell me to call me when I wanted to. She told me to call her at a specific time that was convenient for her. She... You know, I got into living the steps, not not the steps 10, 11, and 12, not the maintenance steps, the growth steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the big book's very clear. If I fail to enlarge my spiritual life, I will, um, you know, I won't be able to stay. And I began to enlarge my spiritual life through living, actively living, staying present and current, staying current in a 10-step, not letting a bunch of stuff pile up so where I would have another whole four through nine to do, actively participating in the 11-step every day. I had not, I had sponsored two women in those eight years. I had not reached out my hand to newcomers. I've been very active in general service, and I hope I have a chance to talk for a second about my experience there. But, but this woman got me working with others, and she did it by example. She would walk up to, you know, I, I to women and she'd say hi my name's cindy are you new to alcoholics anonymous are you taking phone numbers do you have a big book can i give you my number i'm available anytime and i'm like how do you do that she said well i walk up to him and i say hi my name's cindy this is what i do so why don't you do that so i started to do that and i started to be active and actively working with others and i started so active in the 12th step and actively participating in the principles of alcoholics anonymous in my life and my life really started to change i can tell you that for the last 13 years i have not once walked into any meeting telling people not to touch me not to talk to me or that i would kill them and i'm really super grateful for that because the disease of alcoholism for me i described it when i was you know 0 to 12 and those first 8 years the disease of alcoholics anonymous for me it's pain painful here. It hurts. It hurts when I'm, when I'm in it. And it's just, you know, it's so tight and it's so ugly. And it's like, I just got to lash out. I, something's got to give. And I, and I don't live like that. I haven't lived like that in a very long time. Today, I get to step out easy into my life. I get to participate in my life. And, and that doesn't mean I don't get crazy sometimes, but it's not like that. I get to breathe today and, and, you know, and be active in fellowship. Um, my husband's sober in the rooms also. He has a very different path than mine, but for a number of years, our home was a fellowship home for our home group. We would have game nights, and we would have the Christmas party, and we would have fellowship and, and relationship and people in our lives that, that I'm just so, so grateful for. Being active, um, you know, I sponsor just a, a beautiful group of women who teach me so much and reflect so much. Um, you know, I've been through life. I've lived life. My daughter, um, after she finished college, got in a crazy, insane, untreated Al-Anon relationship and uh, tried to commit suicide. And, uh, you know, I got to walk through that in sobriety. And my alcoholic son, you know, completed three treatment centers before he was 17. But, um, you know, he, he, he's out there. He's building his story. I don't, I don't know what his journey is going to be. I know that I love him completely and that Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to be in relationship with him where we can agree to disagree. You know, he's still a truth teller. One day I said, honey, do you want somebody to go to court with you? Because I think it's hard to go to court alone. And he said, oh, mom, you know, I'm planning to lie to the judge and I don't think that would be comfortable for you. So... <laughs> Thanks for the support. <laughs> you know, and I got to tell him, sweetheart, you bet. Um, you know, if you change your mind about that plan, let me know. I'm happy to be there for you. Uh, and in 2011 and 2012, I served my area as delegate to the General Service Conference. I stayed active in general service all through my recovery. And I've so I, I've been a part of Alcoholics Anonymous in, in all of its facets. And I, and I love this fellowship. I love this program. I love that I have a relationship with God today. I'm still not a member of an organized religion, but I have a relationship with a power greater than myself that is active, alive, vibrant, and real that I feel and breathe and know. I, I um, You know, Alcoholics Anonymous brought me into relationship with God, and that brought me into relationship with you. And really, really, that, that disconnect from humanity was what that fear and that pain and that, tr that just that agony of my childhood was built around. And, um, and, I, and I don't have to live like that today. Today I get to be human, I get to be another bozo on the bus, I get to make mistakes and stumble, but I get to grow and learn and continue, you know, um, 
My favorite line in the big book is, the most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. And I believe that for me, that's as true today as it was the day I crawled in here. So thank you for my sobriety. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.